there's no reason why that couldn't be your story. You don't have an expiration date. Oh, I love that. This is the Authors and Agents Podcast. Nicole, I'm super excited to have you here with me today to chat about you and get to know you and to hear about your debut, A Misfortune of Lake Monsters. That came out July 2nd. Can you give me a little blurb for it? Absolutely. Uh, So, A Misfortune of Lake Monsters is a young adult horror novel. And in the in the book, a high school senior's college plans are disrupted when her family elects to take elects her to take over their generation's long legacy of secretly impersonating their rural Pennsylvania town's fake lake monster, which they do to keep tourists coming. Uh, and after discovering a very real and very hungry monster in the lake, our high school senior has to break the secret to her best friend so they can find a way to save the town. I love it. I love it so much. <laughs> it's a fun book. It really is. That uh, is so exciting. Well, you know, to have your debut come out in the world is such a momentous thing, right? So tell me a little bit about your journey to this point. Well, uh, like a lot of people, the road is very convoluted. Uh, so I've always made up stories and written creatively, but as an adult, I didn't really try to get published until I was in my mid 30s. Uh, I had a handful of short stories published pretty quickly after I started submitting them, and probably about a year after that, and th- we're talking like, you know, over 10 years ago at this point, I I had a novel that I had written. It was an adult psychological thriller called The Trajectory of Dreams, and I wasn't, I didn't really think it would be right for the big five market. And maybe that was just me being, you know, nervous. So I went to a micro press called Biting Duck Press, and they specialized in science focused fiction, which the trajectory of dreams is the main character is a sleep lab tech. Uh, She breaks into the homes of astronauts to make sure they can sleep or else. And so that came out in 2013. And it's a very, very strange book, I, I think. It did pretty well, though, for coming out with a micropress. And Emily St. John Mandel, who wrote Station Eleven, blurbed it and really championed it in in on the internet and in public, which was really wonderful. Uh, so, awesome. Yeah, I mean, unexpected. Uh, the thing that happened next, really, I, I don't want to say that the trajectory of dreams getting published helped me get an agent. But an agent did offer to represent me um, for my young adult work shortly thereafter. And unfortunately, despite several rounds of submissions with different novels, nothing really got any bites, which, you know, that's fine. Uh, In the interim of all that, I had been writing short stories that were still finding publication and that eventually expanded to essays and creative nonfiction. Uh, And that all then brings me up to the end of my relationship with that first agent and getting a new agent. And that's where a misfortune of Lake Monsters really happens. Uh, my, My second agent took it on submission. It was on submission for a year or two. We had some bites, but in the end, no acquisition. And so at that point, I was a little bit burned out and not really feeling like maybe I was destined to be a novelist and we my agent and I broke up and randomly I saw a call for submissions from CamCat Books and a friend of mine uh, a writer I know had a book coming out with them and was really happy with, with what they offered as a publishing house randomly I submitted the book and I think I submitted in November 2022 and had an offer for Lake Monsters by the end of the year. Well, that's wonderful. It was a little bit of a (laughs) twisty-turvy journey, right, to get where you are. But I love that you were, I love that you were resourceful, that you, you know, didn't give up and, um, you know, that it led you to where you are now. And I'm assuming you're happy still with, um, you know, your current publisher and excited for, for this to come out. I am. 
I mean, they say that the difference between a published and an unpublished writer is the fact that the published writer just never gives up. Yeah. And I'm certainly proof of that. Yes, definitely proof of that. You you persevered. You made it through <laughs> the, <laughs> the challenging things. <laughs> Well, that is so, so wonderful. What is something that you hope readers take away from A Misfortune of Lake Monsters? So it may be a horror novel, but it's almost a Stranger Things-esque heartwarming fun horror novel, which I think is important to point out. Um, I know a lot of people, when they think horror, they think, you know, it has to be a thing where you know, dozens of people die. It's scary. You're going to be up late at night, not being able to sleep. This is not that book. And I think that's important and needed in horror because not every horror novel has to be exactly the same. Yeah. You know, and as part of that, you know, the thing that I would love readers to take away from the story is that when you're living in a rural town, Uh, I grew up in rural Pennsylvania. It's so disturbing and hard to think about getting what you want as a high school kid. You know, there's not a lot you can do in a rural town once you graduate from high school. You can, you know, maybe work at a factory or try to find a trade apprenticeship. Most of the time, though, if you have aspirations, you're going to have to leave. And that's scary. Yeah, And particularly trying to find your way when there are family expectations around, you know, what you're going to do with your life. You know, it may not be straightforward, but with the right support, whether that's family or friends, you can find your way. And I think that one of the main messages from A Misfortune of Lake Monsters is exactly that. I love that. I love that we can have those reminders even in a horror novel (laughs) (laughs) those are the best places to get them they are they are indeed (laughs) so looking back on your your journey the things you've learned you know everything that's happened to you as an author what is you know like maybe your top advice you'd give to aspiring authors Ooh. so all right so It might not necessarily be novel related, but a former professor of mine, and I graduated from a master's program last year. Um, I have a master's in horror and storytelling. Uh, One of my former professors invites me to talk to her class each semester about seeking publication. Uh, You know, you go to school, you learn about how to write, but no one ever really talks to you about what comes next, how you approach publication and that sort of thing. So the number one piece of advice that I give when I talk to these classes and the piece of advice that seems most well-received is not to self-select out of calls for submission. I think as writers, we tend to be our harshest critics And we see a call for submission and, you know, we think, oh, maybe I have a story for that or maybe I'll write a story for that. And, you know, you start thinking about it more and you're like, they're never going to accept this story. This is not what this this is not really what they're looking for. At least I don't think so. So I'm not going to bother. And the reason I think this is the crappiest way to sort of go about your career is because I edited an anthology called Bodies Full of Burning several years ago. And one of the things that came out of that is I learned very quickly that the the pieces that I had to reject had little to do with talent. I mean, all the stories I was getting were fantastic. But maybe yeah. I already accepted something similar, or I had too many stories that centered on a certain topic, and I needed different things. So yeah. I think the main takeaway there is you don't know what's going to be the right story at the right time for the editor. You know, maybe they need your story. I think it's yeah, important I think that that is- to hear that. Yeah, I think that that is hard advice at times, right? Like, I think we've heard that, especially in like the querying space. Like, oh, yeah. Don't take it personal. 
you know, the agent could have lots of similar authors writing similar stories and all those things. Um, it can be hard advice to swallow <laughs> for sure, but I think it is really uh, beneficial to keep in your mindset because that is such a big part of the business and the industry. Absolutely. We also talk about rejection a lot in these classes because, you know, you assume you're going to, to get a rejection at some point, but I don't think early writers understand the sheer volume of rejection you're going to face. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it's, it'll give you like PTSD opening your email or getting an email <laughs> notification. Like, oh no, Certainly. it's a rejection. <laughs> <laughs> Is it an agent? It's a query response. Oh no. <laughs> oh yeah. Always, <laughs> always fun to answer your emails. Oh my gosh, I know. <laughs> well, Nicole, when you're writing, what is like the act? What is the most the thing you most enjoy about the actual act of writing? And then, what's the most challenging thing for you about writing? When I write, uh, I tend to think of it as a mental health thing for myself. I always have tons of ideas floating around in my head. Maybe it's a character that I'm obsessed with. Maybe it's an idea. And oftentimes, if I don't get those out of my head onto paper, they just keep floating around and I get a, even more obsessed with them. And then I start dreaming about them. And <laughs> it, it's just easier for me to write and like just stop thinking about it. I mean, it might take me a year to get it all out, but at least I'm not, you know, openly just freaking out about something. One of the things that I also tell um, the students when I talk to them is if you can get paid to basically write creative nonfiction, which is writing about your most horrifying times in entertaining ways, you're essentially getting paid to go to therapy. Mm. And so the act of writing really, no matter whether it's creative nonfiction or whatever, kind of feels that way to me. I think it definitely can. I think you can, there's something so great about taking pieces of the hard things of your life, your experiences, putting them in a controlled environment that you can decide <laughs> what happens and work sure. through them, right? I've definitely felt that with different, different stories and different things, you know, it is, yeah, it is absolutely. therapy. Super cathartic. Yes, uh, yes. However, um, the challenging thing is finding the right home for what you write. Not everything you write is going to be fantastic. Not everything you write is going to be right for publication. Um, and that can be stressful if you're very sort of very focused on getting published, which I think it 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 becomes very difficult for people who are focused entirely on publication to come to a place where they're comfortable in terms of moving forward in a way that makes you happy. Yeah, I think it can be hard when it's your, your, your dream, your goal to have it be published and then to sit on it for however long while you query or when you go to submission and it doesn't sell, you know, those are definitely um, heartbreaking things about the traditional publishing industry. Like there, there can be a lot of shelving that could be really difficult. Yeah. I've talked a little bit in, to other people about condoing your writing life, which, you know, I think you can't really do that until you've had some time in the publication, sort of querying trenches, understanding how long things take, what rejection feels like, and, you know, what being published is like in order to find that sweet spot. Yeah. Yeah, that can be a hard one, especially as you transfer from being the artist to the business side of everything. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing those. So th my next question is about genre hopping, which you've sort of already done here, right? With your, um, yeah. <laughs> but if you were to 
try something different after a misfortune of lake monsters you know what's a genre you would in you know like like to try writing so this isn't necessarily genre hopping but I've had some ideas in my head for a horror related picture book for like little kids for quite a while. Um, If I can sort of wrap my head around actual writing picture books, I may (laughs) give it a go. It's a hugely different talent uh, than any other writing that I've done. And that's sort of fun too, because it's a challenge. I had also taken um, a script writing class during my master's program that I really enjoyed. And I've been thinking about toying with some script writing, whether that's horror related or something else. Um, More genre hopping, not necessarily to a place I haven't been before, but there have been some literary novels and short stories floating around in my head as well. Awesome. Sounds like you've got lots of Lots of projects you could jump onto here. Yeah. The problem <laughs> is trying to pick one. <laughs> oh, I, wish there. I have so many like that where I'm like, oh, I'd love to do this and this and this, but which ones do I start first? <laughs> yeah. There's just not enough time to do everything. No, no, there is not. <laughs> well, I'd love to know, Nicole, when you read for pleasure, when you're just reading for yourself, who are some of your favorite authors to read? Well... Uh, I think overall, I've been really lucky in a lot of ways because uh, some of the my favorite writers have ended up becoming, if not friends, then certainly people that I can rely on for advice and things like that. I was very lucky to have asked some of my favorite speculative authors to read and blurb A Misfortune of Lake Monsters. And I was very lucky that pretty much everyone I asked said yes. Uh, those are Jonathan Mayberry, Gretchen McNeil, Nova Rensuma, Robert Atone, Amalinda Barube, and Keely pa- Parrick, which I love all of them so much. For most of those, um, I, like five out of six, I've been a fan for like years and years. I have their signed books in my house. Nova oh, my is one of my favorite people. She was a, the professor of my very last class during my master's program. And she has been incredibly supportive of me. I can't credit her enough with just being an awesome person and a great writer. Really just a perfect example for me to follow. Uh, Other folks that I have not yet gotten to talk to, and one of them I never will, uh, John Irving and James Morrow are two of my favorite authors. I read everything they have ever written. The same is true of Octavia Butler. I'm late to Butler. I had never read any of her work other than Kindred until I took a semester long course on her work. I mean, just an incredible writer and really visionary. I mean, Parable of the Sower alone, more relevant than ever. Well, it sounds like you have got some authors you really enjoy. And I love asking this question, even though I'm sure you could like go on and on and on because there's people who are listening who have never heard of those authors somehow, right? And they'll be able to to add some t- to their list. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> well, I'd love to know throughout your writing journey, who have been your biggest supporters? <laughs> so... I think it's a little bit of a cliche to say my husband, but that's kind of true. He doesn't actually actively support my writing in terms of like, you know, he reads what I'm writing. He, you know, gives me advice. However, when you're writing a novel, and I'm sure you know this, you tend to ignore people. And (laughs) we've been married for, I guess, 24 years now or close to 24 years. And there have been months that go by where I barely say two words to him other than like, hello, kiss him, good morning, or, you know, goodbye. And he hasn't divorced me yet. So that's support. That is good. Oh, yeah. That is support. (laughs) I'm also really lucky to have some great writing groups that I'm in who have been supportive. Mm, That's awesome. I think you need to have both of those, right? Like you need to have the people at home, who are like, okay, I know you still love me, even though you're sitting on your computer, staring at 
not paying attention to me. And you need to have like the people in who do the same thing, who, who write or in, understand the industry, right? Who you can go to and be like, what is happening? For sure. <laughs> Someone the other day asked me if Oh, it was actually in one of my old professor's classes, asked me if writing was sort of a lonely thing. And the answer is yes and no. Like, obviously, you're writing in a solitary fashion most of the time, but it's important to find your community, like you said. And I think through having that community around you, it becomes an awful lot less lonely. Yeah, it does indeed. It is great to have those people around you. So I'd love to know when you are writing, you know, what's your writing fuel? Like maybe not while you're actually writing, but when you're taking a break from writing, what's your like go-to snack or drink? Like when you need a little pick me up. I drink inordinate amounts of tea, hot tea. Uh, what I am kind a, of tea? Oh, favorite? I am a huge tea fan. Um, and when I say that, I mean, when I go on vacation, I buy tea. So awesome. my very favorite tea, which I have not been able to find in several years, is a tea that I first had in Hong Kong. And it is marigold leaf tea, but it's made from the leaves of a certain type of marigold that's grown in China, high in the mountains. And last year, I found seeds to grow these marigolds. What? And I swear to you. And I'm going to try it this year and see if it grows in my yard. I love it. Well, yes. Yeah. And then you can make your own tea from It those will clouds. please me so much if this works. It's an experiment. Um, <laughs> the, the tea house in Hong Kong where I got this tea originally closed down, I want to say maybe three years ago. And up mm. until that time, they had been sending me tea internationally because I couldn't find it anywhere else. Oh, it's delicious. So yeah. fingers crossed that this works out. I can't wait to hear if it works out. That's going to be a lot of work to put in though, to <laughs> try it and see if it's going to work. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. Fingers crossed. Yeah. I planted Fingers most of my crossed. garden earlier today for this season. So I have not yet planted these marigolds yet, though. I haven't found like the perfect spot. Yes, you need to have the perfect spot, the perfect soil so they can thrive. Yeah. And now I'm not sure if it's going to really work out that well because I'm not high in the mountains even a little bit. But hey, dare to dream. Yes, you can try and it might still be good. Oh, it I might, hope it, so. It'll be Worth, worth a shot for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, Nicole, my last question, it sounds kind of difficult, but it's not. I'd love to know what your favorite book is right now. This is not your favorite book of all time. This is not the best book you've ever read. This is just a book you've read recently that you were like, that was really great. And I want other people to know about it. All right. Well, uh, I am very lucky in that I'm part of a 2024 debut authors group, and I just finished two books from 2024 debut authors that I thought were absolutely fantastic. One of which is The Last Fee Hunter. It's a fantasy novel by Salonay Goldenberg. Uh, it is, I'm not a fantasy reader, really, mostly okay. because I find the world building so noticeable in a lot of them. Sal's yeah. book does the world building in such like a natural, clever way. And she focuses a lot on Thai folklore, which is also unbelievably fun. The second book is called Lockjaw, and it is a YA horror novel by Matteo Cirilli. It's, I can't even describe it. It's so good. And one of the things I loved about it is that it has, at least in some small way, the point of view of the main character's dog. And there is another hmm. book that does that. Um, it is, uh, I believe it's Patrick Ness, The Knife of Letting Go or something like that. But in that particular book, there's a point of view of the dog, which has always really made me very happy. So the fact that Mateo included that in Lockjaw 
just thrilled me to death. It's both of those books are just incredible. And those are only the most recent two that I've read. All the books that I've read from 2024 debut authors this year have just been fantastic. Oh, I love it. It's a good, yeah. good debut year to be a part of. Oh, unbelievable. I will also <laughs> recommend one that is not a 2024 debut book this year in terms of like, what is my favorite book that I've recently read? And recent is relative because we're talking last year. I am absolutely freaking obsessed with Monstrilio by Gerardo Samano Cordova. Have you read that? I haven't read it. Oh my God. It is. Okay. So I'm just going to give you a brief sort of synopsis of how it starts, but um, a couple's son dies and the mother digs out a little piece of her dead son's liver and grows a new creature out of it. Good. And it's, it, <laughs> yeah, it sounds horrific and parts of it are kind of horrific, but it's also like a really amazing treatise on grief. Hmm. I mean, just unbelievable. It, I believe he was a debut author last year. And for this to be That's his different. debut novel, I'm just blown away. You know, you got to think on that one, like, how did he come up with that idea? What sparked that <laughs> idea for him? <laughs> yeah, I mean, unbelievably gorgeous writing. I mean, un just everything about it is perfect. Well, that is a good one to add to our list, especially for mm -hmm. those who love horror. Even if you don't love horror, that is an excellent book to read. Um, it's more of like a literary horror. Uh, oh gosh, I just can't stop talking about it. <laughs> That's exactly what this Obviously, question is for. Sure. <laughs> it's for books. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Nicole, thank you for sharing those and thank you for letting me pick your brain. I'm so excited for you. I'm so excited for A Misfortune of Lake Monsters to come out. I can't wait to read it because it sounds so wonderful. And, you know, I love horror. It's like one of my favorite things to read and not really watch anymore. I have a hard time with horror <laughs> movies. Horror books are like where I can get my fill. So thank you so much for chatting with me. Oh, thank you for having me on it. I so appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs>